talk to you today. Dr. Rahman, as, as, as you've already heard, is um, a, a very, very well-renowned oncologist doctor in, in, in the U.S., but he's also a writer, and um, he has written for his columns, essays, and stories have appeared in the New York Times, Harvard Review, International Herald Tribune, Guardian, Wall Street Journal, I could go on. So I think we'll start by actually perhaps starting with a reading from the book. And Should I go there? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, I'd like to first thank my editor, Renika Chatterjee, for helping me with the book and Dr. Chatterjee for the speaking time. And also would like to thank the Times of India for uh, producing such a fine program. And most importantly, Dr. Ramali and the, all of you for coming here. I know so many competing programs. This story happened more than 50 years ago. Am I clear? This story happened more than 50 years ago when I was a medical student at Dhaka Medical College and a first rotation in the surgical world. And a father brought his nine-year-old son, his name was Toby, to the surgical world. And the boy had severe swelling of the right thigh, swelling and pain. So doctors told him, his father, that the boy had infection and that by treating with antibiotics and he will get better. But the truth turned out to be quite different. And here are three characters. One is CA, who is the chief assistant of the professor, and the father of the boy, and I, the medical student. In the end, the CA, the clinical assistant, came to grips with his main dilemma. Am I clear? Sometimes I'm, I want to make sure. Thank you. In the end, the CA came to grips with his main dilemma, the need to tell the father the bleak truth. I was grateful that he did not order me to break the news, and I watched intently as he spoke to Toby's father. Toby is the boy. Toby has cancer of the bone. He said, we must amputate his right thigh. May Allah forgive me. The father said, how is this possible? I thought he had an infection as being cured by strong antibiotics. It's not an infection, the CA said, it's a cancer. And to avoid a prolonged discussion, he added, the diagnosis of infection was wrong. The last statement turned out to be a bad mistake, for it only compounded the problem with the boy's treatment. The father was stunned. The doctors had just admitted that they made a wrong diagnosis when your son was admitted. Now the same doctors wanted to cut off his limb. This is my only son, Huzur, the father pleaded. What will happen to his life without a leg? How will he make a living? Which parents will let their daughters marry him? He will be an invalid and outcast. Tears rolled down his cheeks. He was, of course, right. Our culture treated the disabled with pity and kindness, but not with respect. The operation was scheduled, but the father still remained opposed to it. Dr. Saev, he said, he said to the CA, I could not take him home without a leg. I'll not be able to face his mother. All this time, we had been talking to the father away from his son's bedside. We had not yet told Toby about his cancer, but putting the bits and pieces together, he had come to the conclusion that he had a serious illness and that he might die. What exactly is wrong with me? He asked me during one conversation. I had been hoping that he would put this question to someone else. In my desperation, I had the impulse to give him the horrible news and get it over with. But I found neither the heart nor the courage to, to be honest with him. The sea had asked us not to frighten the boy with a fatal prognosis. Yet, I had, no, I had to answer his question somehow. I could not simply walk away. I don't know for sure, Toby, I said. You better ask the CA when he comes again. I sensed that he did not believe me, for it, he followed up with more questions. What is cancer? Do I really have it? Am I going to die? We had, been we had developed a report over time, so he felt comfortable asking me. The frightened boy who had come to the ward a short while ago had grown up quickly. It was hard to avoid his point blank questions. This time I gave him frank answers. And to my surprise, he did not become as upset as I had expected. He even thanked me for telling him the truth. 
Toby taught me a lesson that I sorely needed, even with our subterfuge. Patients sensed what went on around them. Patients wanted truth, no matter how difficult. And truth built trust between doctors and patients. The surgery professor's patients ran out. I don't want anyone to die in my unit without the needed operation, he demanded. Call the father. The poor man was intimidated by the reputation of this famous surgeon. But by now, the father had understood that his assistant had not helped his son. You are his father and his mother, Huzur. He told the professor, his life is in your hands. The amputation was done, and Toby survived the operation. But while his surgical wounds were healing, he became short of breath. We thought of pneumonia or pulmonary embolism, the usual post-operative complications. A new chest X-ray, however, proved us utterly wrong. He had developed overwhelming pulmonary metastasis. His lungs were full of round tumors, the probable metastatic cannon bone lesions, which were relentlessly devouring his organs. Toby was soon using every bit of his strength to breathe. Toby died on the last weekend of my surgical rotation. For weeks, I could not forget his face. A feeling of helplessness overcame me. How stoic he was. I could not fathom how a little boy would use to so much anguish. I realized I must be as resilient as Toby was. In this hectic place, Toby was soon forgotten except for his chest X-rays. His film became a permanent part of the teaching file because he was such an interesting case. It was an enigma to me how fast a human being turned into an impersonal case. Thank you. That was a really uh, moving moment in the book. When I was reading it, I, it, it definitely stayed with me afterwards, thinking about that person. And I wanted to start our conversation by asking about memory. So much of your book is about memory and your memory of Bangladesh and your childhood and growing up in Bangladesh. But also, as the narrative goes into your adulthood and you become a doctor, it becomes clear that key to your being a doctor is empathy and the memory of patients that you've worked with. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a very good question. I think I was asked these questions before also. Um, my mother died when I was only seven. So she had a brother whom she loved dearly. Am I clear? Thank you. And so she used to tell me, someday you will be a doctor for Zur and save lives. So that kind of stuck to my mind because my mother died right after that rather suddenly. If she lived for a long time, she probably would have told me a lot of other things. You know the Bengali mothers. And I probably would have forgotten that. But the fact that she told me someday you will be a doctor and save lives and then she died suddenly, that is stuck to my mind. And then right after she died, as the book says, that I developed Kalazar, which is a parasitic infection, very common infection in those days, malaria, Kalazar, typhoid, tuberculosis, uh, sometimes a smallpox. So I have seen those things, plus I almost died of that infection. So all these things stuck to my mind. So when I became a doctor, uh, I had a sense that I have been through that. So I hope that I can make some difference. I, I'm no better or no worse than any other doctor, but I try to remember that when I went to the bedside, despite all this technology and all these things, you know. So if that answers your question, that my upbringing, the way I felt my own suffering and all that, that is stayed in my mind. Your book starts with your memory of home, mm -hmm. and it's one of the most uh, simple and moving descriptions of, of home that, that I've read. And it made me think that so much of literature, especially fiction perhaps, is about the search for home. Yes. And I think as we grow older, we realize that home is actually a place in time and not just space, and maybe we cannot go back to it. Were you writing to go home? Oh, thank you, Antra. That's a, that's a very good question. <clears throat> See, I was brought up in a Bengali culture, the time and the place and the people. Uh, I think that we have to accept changes, but those are all gone. 
and I didn't want to be forgotten that. You know, the way things were, the people, places and cultures, and those palaces, mosques, temples, you know, the flowers and the trees and the rivers and all this nature that we had, those are all gone, uh, mostly all people now, an explosion of population. And I did not want it to be forgotten. And so that's part of the story, that is I wanted to keep it alive so that the new generation will know how it was not to forget that. Plus, yes, you're right. Uh, you, I always try to go home, so wherever I am, that is my home, but I cannot forget where I was born and brought up. Thank you. One of the um, aspects of the book that I particularly enjoyed, um, and to share with the audience, I lived in Bangladesh for the last year. And when I was there for Durga Pujo, I'm Bangali as well, as is Dr. Rahman, uh, I was so thrilled to see that there were so many Muslims at Durga Pujo in Dhaka. And at first I was asking my friend, how is it that there are so many Hindus in Dhaka? I didn't know that. And she said, they're not Hindus, they're Muslim. And it was really such an eye-opening thing for me to see so many uh, Muslims celebrating Pujo, doing Anjali, etc. And in your book, there is a, mo there is a moment where uh, you talk about being in a school where Saraswati Pujo is yes. celebrated. And Saraswati is the goddess of Learning. education and knowledge, etc and your Hindu friends would pray to her and surreptitiously in your head you would also say you know give let me also do well don't don't leave me behind what was it like when you were a child in that environment with Hindus and Muslims and different cultures and traditions do you think it was a conscious thing did you feel conscious that this is not mine this is mine what was it like that's a good question I think uh, my wife and grew up pretty much the same way and uh, uh, the, we did not think that, you know, you are Hindu or you are Muslim. I'm not saying that everything was perfect. Mm. But when we had Eid, our Hindu friends came to us, celebrated. When there are the, which is the biggest puja festival of, of Bengal. Uh, by the way, Bengali Hindus are more puja festival than other Hindus in India. <laughs> so, we didn't see much difference. And, but like my book says, the temple road, that was the road. Actually, the temple is still there. It's a Hare Krishna temple. And I had to go to school through that village. I love this cover, Renuka. You know, this, a lot of people have asked me that this little boy going through this Rasta, Mandirka Rasta, and going to school. So if I did not take that road from my village to the school, I wouldn't be where I am today. So that's why all those temples, characters, all my Hindu friends, Muslim friends, all came together. And Swaratishri Puja was a big thing in this school, Goddess of Learning. To answer your question, my biggest competitor, I think I named him was Ashit Kumar. He was very tough, he was very good in math. And I was a good student, but uh, I couldn't beat him in math. And Ashit would pray that, uh, Goddess Swaratishri, at least let me be number one one time. And so I would say, Goddess Saraswati, just because I'm a Muslim, don't forget me. I don't want to lose my number one place. If that answers his question. That's a friendly, you know, we were very good friends. I miss him a lot. And, but, so that's how things were. Uh, we grew up like that. You know, we still have friends uh, uh, that we can't tell the difference. You know, they practice their own thing, and we practice our own thing. But socially, we're pretty much the same. I think the Deccan Chronicle, the Deccan Chronicle has kind of, uh, review has really expressed my sentiment very well. Uh, if you have a time, you can read that. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. It was extremely engaging and funny and interesting to read about your relationships with your fellow students and especially with your teachers. Yes. Um, they all seemed incredibly strict to me. Mm -hmm. um, and. But it was also, so in, in many ways, it sort of seems like a throwback because they were very strict. Um, it was very black and white. There was no discussion. There was no questioning, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's also very clear from your narrative that you have very positive memories of those yes. interactions and that these teachers were mentors for you and you really looked up to them and you trusted them implicitly. So tell, how, is, how has that experience 
uh, influenced you as a, as a teacher and a, as a doctor, very senior doctor now? Thank you. Thank you, Antra. Um, you know, like, uh, like the book says, when my mother died and I had Kalazar myself and missed school, <clears throat> and you all of you know that, that when you fail a class, you're kind of an outcast, you know, especially 50, 60 years ago. And uh, one of the teachers, Horan Sir, I mentioned, his name was Horendra Nath Mazumdar. He was my father's friend, very good teacher. He taught us math. His donor came to me and said that, Fazlur, don't worry, you just read one thing at a time and you can catch up that way. Because once I came back to school after three, four months of illness, it looked like a sea of reading. I, what would I do? I couldn't. So Horan Sir encouraged me. And I've never forgotten that. Then the second, is when I was in medical school, I had a professor named S.M. Rob, and he always told us that simply assembling the facts, you can assemble scientific facts, that's not enough to take care of patients. You have to understand their life, and you understand the patients, their feelings, their... So even with the, all the technology, that I tried not to forget that, that bedside teaching, that the, your treatment begins with the bedside empathy for patients. So it is from my teachers plus my own experience. So when I teach medical ethics, I start with, I didn't put it in the book, I start with Chekhov's, he's one of my most favorite writers, Anton Chekhov, he was a doctor too. And word number six, and word number six, uh, if I can explain a little bit, could I? Of course. Word number six is a story about a doctor of a psychiatric ward. And they treated the psychiatric patient very badly. They will beat them up if they don't listen. That happened everywhere, but this is a Russian story. And the doctor said, well, this is the way things are. There's nothing I can do. But the quirk of fate, the doctor himself was admitted to the same psychiatric ward. And obviously, because he was a patient, the orderlies started beating him up. And the, gave him a blow, he became unconscious and died. But before he died, he kept thinking, how could I have ignored for 20 years this kind of suffering to my patients? I was right here, and I never paid attention to it. Now same things are happen happening to me. How is that possible? So when you start with a story like that with the students, they kept, you know, it's easier to teach them with the poetry and literature than sometimes having a thick textbook. So I start with word number six and then go on like that. And my own writing, I've written quite a bit about patient stories, this and that. And they are short pieces, and the students seem to like that. So from that, I try to teach empathy. I'm no better, no worse than any other doctor. My wife is here. I don't want to sound too smart, you know. But uh, literature seems to teach me a lot, besides my teachers. The role of girls and women um, is, is, is quite important in your novel. Yes. The book starts with your mother yes. and your relationship with your mother, but you also clarify that it's not just your um, view of your mother as, as a loving son. She was, she was a figure in the village. She was somebody that was looked up to and loved in the village, and you were known as her son, um, which, I, which I thought was lovely. You were known as Hasina Chile. And then later on, as you talk about um, when you're at Dhaka Medical College, you talk about your, your friend Roshni with whom you work, and then you talk about meeting your wife, Jahanara. It's really nice to see um, authors reflect on um, the role of, of women and girls with, with sensitivity, but also honesty. What do you think has changed since, since the time you were a child uh, in terms of gender in, in, in the subcontinent? I think, in, I know, the, the, my experience is that the, the culture and society that I was brought up, you're talking about 50, 60 years ago, you had to respect your elders, whatever they said, especially if they were grandmother or mother. So my grandmother had a lot of influence on me too. What had changed is that certain things have gotten better because women have more authority, more power, uh, more education, uh, many respect, respected more. Uh, but there are things, uh, also I think I don't approve, or I feel kind of 
bad about it. I don't want to get into politics. Uh, but look how Hillary Clinton was treated as a marginal figure, you know, she's smart and everything. So I think this kind of disrespect, uh, chauvinism, seems like we haven't gotten rid of it. To answer your question, something has gotten better and something has gotten worse. I love the figure of your grandmother in the book. Yes. She's, she's the matriarch and, and she makes a lot of decisions on, on behalf of the family. And there was no, um, there was no contradiction in the fact that she was a woman, she was deeply spiritual and, and very much a Muslim, and yet she had no trouble uh, denouncing certain practices that she thought were... So wh how, do you do, how was that growing up for you as, as a Muslim? How did that affect your identity? Did it also lead you to question what you know, a Malvi might say or what a book might say, etc.? My grandmother, grandmother was a very, very interesting figure because she lost her husband when she was very young and then she had three, four children, you know, and she had to take care of that. So that plus the kind of family she came from that uh, very few people challenged her authority. I'm not saying that all women had that privilege, but she had that privilege coming from that family. And um, like I said in the book, she did not have a real lot of complicated philosophy, just like I was telling about the cholera epidemic, okay? It's a very interesting story that we have a village, one is Puravari, which is mine, another village called Narayanpur. Lot of villages that I have, they all have Hindu names, like Krishnapur, Narayanpur, Shripchandrapur, you know, so this is where I grew up. And there was a colony of the Muchis, to give you a perspective, uh, the Narayan people said they are untouchables. And you know the Muchis, they work with leather and all that, and they take care of the dead cattle and all uh, this, among other things. Uh, the Narayan people didn't want to claim them, and Puravadians didn't want to claim them. Yeah. Correct? They're just in an isolated colony. So when the cholera epidemic came, some didn't want to take the trouble to include them inside, you know, what is called sealing ceremony. There was a belief that if you go around the village and pray, then the bad influences, the bad, uh, what do you say, spirits, bad spirits will not enter into your village. Am I clear? Bad spirits will not enter into our village. And so the, even the upper caste, they didn't want to include them. Okay. But my grandmother's point was that these people live with us, they work for us, okay? We, so they're just as any other human being, not a complicated philosophy. Told my father and uncle to include them. You know, some people didn't mind, other people grudgingly accepted, that's why do you have to do for them? You know, they're not part of us. So those things happen because of intermixing, having feeling for people, treating them as human beings. So I think that was her character, you know. I had, I had trouble with her too in some respect. When I was in college, uh, like you said, she was a deeply spiritual woman. Anything that happens, she will say, this is God's will. And some things would bother me that a child died, how could it be God's will, you know, the child hasn't done any harm. Uh, but as I grew older, and saw myself, you know, being a cancer specialist, see the of death and dying and suffering sometimes. I understood how that was her coping mechanism. She probably really believed that this is God's will. But I wish that I could go back and tell her that I understood better now, but I can't, you know, she's gone. So her philosophy, because of she dealt with people everyday life, that she took them as human beings, you know, regular human beings. Not necessarily being that they are all equal, no, that's not the point. But if they had trouble, she helped them, regardless. Tell us about the process of writing this book. You are a very, very uh, well-acclaimed doctor, so I imagine the demands on your time must be several. So what, there must have been some burning desire to write this book. How did you make it happen? <laughs> that's, I, I guess I could say, Jahanar was not said, I'm so smart that I just sat down and put it together. No, that's not the story. It's, it's writing is hard work for me, you know. And uh, 
it was a difficult plus especially writing a memoir because you trying to be as frank as you can but you offend some people uh, I had to work in between because the cancer practice can be very involved with patients you know you can't just simply it's not like sore throat I'm not demeaning any kind of illness it's not sore throat that take penicillin come back in a week if you have given chemotherapy to someone they have they get sick they get nausea vomiting they get weak they have other problems so you're constantly engaged with them uh, and so that and then you have a family young wife and children so it was a struggle a little bit juggling between my career and between my family and then in between doing some writing uh, and I've written most of my life, you know, uh, but I wish I went to the book writing from the very beginning rather than writing articles and essays uh, for magazines and papers. So I had to discipline myself that I have a certain amount of time and I'm going to use as much as I can. And you, you know about Annie Dillard, uh, I understand it better than I did then. Annie Dillard said that how we pass our days is how we pass our lives. That's, that's very true. Your brother became a novelist yes. and you became a doctor, yes. which is interesting because in that debate, he took the side of the, yes. of the sword and you had taken the side of the pen. How did your brother feel about you beginning to write and did you exchange your writings with each other? My brother writes a completely different kind of book. She, she likes about villas people, uh, this and that, you know, like, she, he has the same problem all novelists have, that he has a small following, you know. Uh, we had in the past talked to each other, uh, but uh, we have two different styles, you know. He still lives in the village, and of course I live in big cities here and there. So to answer your question, we have certain things similar with certain things dissimilar, you know, different style, uh, if that answers his question. But he's always been very good to me because without him, I probably wouldn't have made it without him and without my grandmother. We don't always agree with each other. Like, I, I think I put it in the book about an essay in the Harvard Review that uh, his way of looking at things is different from mine. Since I'm in America for so many years, success to me that different from success for him in the village, you know. But some of my favorite moments in the book are describing your early days with your brother Correct. and the mischief you got up to and you as the younger brother trying to be like him yes. and Correct. trying to drive the bullock cart Correct. like him. Those are very, very poignant and, and very, very sweet moments. Which brings me to a question I had about family. In your description of family uh, and community, and I think this is true for space as well. So now when I think about my home growing up, I grew up in a flat in Bombay on the 18th floor. It was very, uh, it was very definite. The walls were very clear of my house. I don't think the same was true of your house growing up. You don't even use the word house, you use the word homestead. And you talk about this forest behind my house and this path and this pukur, this pond. And it's, it's not actually clear to me which ponds were specifically belonging to your family, which ponds were not. And I think that was not the point. The point was this is the space you inhabited. Similarly with your family, yes, there's your immediate nuclear family and you talk about your father and your mother and your brother, but your cousin's sisters were clearly important to you. Yes. Your, I think Chotoma was also a relative and very, very important to you. So in that sense, it feels like your childhood had more generous borders uh, than perhaps minded or perhaps life today does. Do you want to say anything about that? About the childhood? Yeah, about how has family, the notion of family changed from, from your childhood? Family has changed a great deal because now like when my wife and I go to Bangladesh, you know, during our time we used to sing Robin Dushangit. Every Bengali, whether literate, illiterate, or uh, Hindu, Muslim, it doesn't matter, Sikh, Christian, Buddhist, you know, they all sang Ravindra Sangeet. Now you go to the kids, they have a cell phone and listening to Bombay music. Yeah. Okay, so that's one thing, cultural influences, uh, the way I was brought up, it's not the same as before. So that has changed a lot. And then the second is that the, 
even like uh, we have quite a few Indian students in our university, and I asked them about the Satyajitra, about the Opur Shankar, you know, the world of Opur and all those movies, and they have hardly any idea who Satyajitra is. So uh, the culture has changed because time has changed, and it has to change. We have to accept change. But I'm not one of those things that we should completely forget our past. I think that's part important to keep our sense of balance. Should we open it up to questions and maybe take a couple of questions from the audience? I have several more questions sure. to ask, but I'm trying to be generous here. Hello. Hello. I'm audible, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, Dr. Ramji, uh, you know, uh, this is the point I was trying to make without painting all doctors in India with the same brush, that there is a general feeling in the public that doctors treat the patient and the disease as a commodity. From your days and what you have been narrated so far, there is a human touch to the professional doctor and when they deal with the patients and the disease. What do you think? Why this kind of change is happening when there is a commoditization? Whether this is some lack in the medical education system or is it because you have a background, you have come from a, of people like you have come from a kind of a place which was less privileged, a system which was less privileged, we have seen those things. So you are able to connect better with the patient. Why this change is happening? And whether this change will further aggravate? Thank you. That's an extremely good question. That's, that's one of my uh, discomfort and sadness in medicine. And again, I don't sound like I'm any better or any worse than any other doctor. Uh, technology you know, has improved a lot, quality of life and uh, technology has brought these things up. But what has happened is that the money has become a big part of medicine. It's all over the world, you know, US and India. And the med in the medical school, the emphasis is you cannot get up without learning science. That's why at least in the US there is a push to teach medical humanities to the students. That's what I teach through literature, you know, poetry and all that, uh, poetry essays and stories. So why this has happened? Partly because of the uh, money, you know, income, and the second is because of the technology, we misuse it quite a bit. So in my time, we didn't have much technology, so we had to use a lot of bedside medicine, talk to the patient, make a diagnosis. Now if you complain some chest discomfort and all that, the doctors will order a CAT scan. Correct? It saves time, nobody wants to take time anymore. There are two doctors, bad doctors every time. So I have been an advisory committee of the medical school, the US Medical Society the Medical School. And in our school, first year and fourth year, medical humanity is compulsory. Okay, you have to take We hope and feel that we can teach the new better. Stand at the patient's shoes, how the patient feels. So, if we, too much interest in science is causing the problem, too much interest in technology is causing the problem. So, I think that in medical school, we have to start from the very beginning, teach the student that you are treating human beings. When a patient comes with lung cancer, or breast cancer, or colon cancer, that patient not only has cancer, the patient has family, the patient has children, has spouses. Has has jobs, have difficulties, have insurance problems, money problems, correct? You don't have to take all your time for each patient. But if you give a little bit of time and listen carefully, you learn a lot within a few minutes. That's what I talked about in my book. Professor Rob told me that your healing begins with your empathy and with your presence at the bedside, not any order of the tests. To answer your question, why this is happening? Because the whole society is changing now. And uh, technology plus medicine has become a big business. So that answers your question. But I think we have to reorient ourselves. We have to teach the students uh, the human side of medicine, not just science. And I think we can do that. Does that answer your question? Definitely. That actually links beautifully with what your mother had. I think your mother had wanted you to be a doctor to help the people. And, and that is clearly your driving mission. So it, it's, it's wonderful that your history and your childhood has influenced you as a doctor in, in that way. It's 
sorry indeed, but I, I don't say that I may have had my experience with a good doctor. I think uh, when the students come to medical school, pre-med students, medical students, they don't come with, you know, their back is up with I think the way you teach them, that's the problem. You know, young people are very impressionable. Of course, they want to be successful there monetarily, professionally, but if we reorient our teaching, I think we'll do that better.
especially in the villages. So I couldn't do that. So we got married in a half hour back early in the day. Okay. And the marriage ceremony lasted about like maximum 10-15 minutes. The Imam who came, because I knew Quranic verses at that time quite well, he missed half the verses in the day. Anyway, so we got married and I have to leave in a week. Uh, so this story, I'm working on that, the love and marriage. Uh, and the interesting thing about it that because we are so young, uh, people said that marriage won't last because you know, they have heard people say that all the time. But we have waited 25 years. So people who say it would last, they're all gone. So I can't go back and tell them it lasted. I think 25 years long enough. So I'm working on that now. Maybe they will be interested in someday. Uh, so love and marriage, you know, she and I. I can't wait to read that. That, sounds that. that was actually one of my questions to him, but it left me wanting more. It sounded like such an interesting romance and, and beginning to a marriage. And I, I said I wanted to read more about that. And that's what he's writing about. So really looking forward to reading that book. I think that's all we have time for now because I think the next session we'll have to start. Thank you so much, so much, Dr. Raman. Onik, onik, We had a wonderful time. Uh, I'm sure this book is available at the, at, at the bookstore. So please do, do go pick up a copy. Thank you so much. Thank you.